Good morning, I'm Julio Sainz along with Mauricio Riveros. Today we'll meet Mike McCray and Dr. Patron from St. Anne's Community and learn how they've overcome the challenges of COVID. We hope you will be inspired. Celebrating leaders in Rochester's unique and vibrant business community, we'll meet entrepreneurs whose passion and perseverance have helped push through life's challenges. Join us as we share their stories and journeys to success. It's time to be inspired. Hi, Mike. Um, hi, Dr. Petron. Thank you very much for being in Be Inspired, a show that we developed to inspire our community, to interview people like you who have experience in different markets, in different aspects. In this case, we'll talk about senior living, and this is an exciting time, of course, challenging time, but at the same time, uh, very, very happy to be with you today. So let's start uh, knowing who is Mike McRae and who is Dr. Petron. Let's start with the ladies first. Dr. Petron, welcome. Well, thank you. Um, it's nice to be with you as well. So my name is Kim Petron. I'm the medical director here at St. Anne's, and I have been um, the medical director here since 2016. Um, I did a fellowship in geriatrics before taking on this role, which means I did some specialized training in um, in geriatrics following an internal medicine residency. And, um, you know, I really uh, enjoy this job immensely. It has been certainly challenging over the last few months, um, but we have seen, um, despite all of the challenges, some really remarkable work on the part of our staff. And of course, um, older people always teach us so much. So they have continued through this crisis to be uh, sage, um, you know, points of wisdom for all of us to learn from and um, have really come through this with such grace. Um, and um, it's really been a privilege to, to care for them. So um, that's kind of my story. I'll turn it over to Mike. Well, thank you, Dr. Patrone and Mauricio. My name is Michael McRae. I have the privilege of being the president and CEO at St. Anne's. Uh, next month, I'll be coming up on my 10-year anniversary there. I've been the CEO coming up on six years. And, uh, you know, there's never a time when you prove that you're going into battle with just top caliber people than uh, having a worldwide pandemic. And having to get through that, navigate it, and come out doing so well is a testament to the team that we have at St. Anne's and the, the deep-rooted commitment that we have to our elders that we serve each and every day. Well, we, we invite you because we know that uh, this has been a very challenging time for senior living in general and uh, be able to overcome the challenge of COVID and, and managing that. And, you know, one thing that I, I really respect is that you guys have been able to be successful and overcome and, and pass through many challenges. So tell us a little bit, what was the journey through this COVID-19 stage? So my or Dr. Petron, please. How about I jump in and kind of give you the administrative look, and then I defer to Dr. Patron to talk about the, uh, the clinical approach and the boots on the ground. Uh, I'll share with you that things started to unfold and unfold rapidly in late February and early March. As much as you think you're prepared for just about anything that life can throw at you, this really took it to a whole new dimension. Not only the vulnerability of the population that we care for, but many of our people in our workforce are very vulnerable to this as well. And we asked them to show up each and every without fail, provided them with the proper PPE to go and do their job. And we were adapting and adjusting uh, without exaggeration in 30 minute increments uh, at the peak of everything unfolding. So what I found was across all of our communities, it was a true testament to individuals stepping up, but when it comes to the clinical side and what it was like on the resident care floors, I would turn that over to Dr. Patron. Yeah, I would echo what, um, echo a lot of what Mike just um, mentioned. Um, things really did change dramatically for us, I would say, at the beginning of March. Um, and um, right around March 13th was when the executive order from the governor came that we could no longer have visitors. And, um, you know, St. Anne's is, is a home. It's a home um, for people who, who have lived a long, rich life. And a home um, when you can't see your family and friends is, is a very challenging um, prospect. So the very first major thing that we struggled with was how are we going to bring joy and how are we going to bring community to a place that was essentially 
sort of locked out and socially distanced in the real sense of that term from their family, from their friends, and from the rest of the community. We certainly understand why that had to happen in terms of viral transmission and spread, but that was our first challenge. And then, as Mike said, um, almost daily there was a new mandate that came down um, from the um, from from Albany about how to manage uh, care. Some of that were pretty easy to execute. Others were much more challenging. Um, but I would say that what we learned was to be nimble. We learned to be flexible. We also found that people were much more willing to be cross-trained. Um, we are so fortunate at St. Anne's to have an amazing workforce whose passion is for um, older adults. And even if they signed up to do, say, um, their main job was to do you know, cooking, they were very willing to come up and do what it to get done on that day to make sure that um, care was provided in the way that it needed to be and that um, joy was brought to our residents. One of the things we've heard from a few of the uh, different uh, business owners and leaders we've had on the show in the last few weeks is how they uh, took care of their employees, what they did to try to step up and, and take care of the, in your case, the caretakers. Can you share a little bit about what that was like and some of the initiatives you took? Absolutely, um, and feel free to chime in, Mike. Um, so um, we did recognize the toll that this would take on our staff. Um, uh, at the out, you know, at the outside of this, there was just sort of fear, really, just about you know how contagious was it, how lethal was it, um, and what could best protect them. So one of the very first things that we implemented was really good communication. So we had daily um, telephone calls and huddles with all of our staff members to make sure that they were receiving information in real time and that they were receiving accurate information because as you uh, witnessed through this, um, sometimes you would get a news briefing that would say one thing and then the second news briefing would completely contradict it. So it was really important for them to have um, facts, not um, a lot of you know hearsay. Uh, we offered free meals um, throughout the um, whole entire time that um, we were experiencing the greatest you know, epidemic in our community. Um, we felt that that was really important because we were asking people to flex their schedules at times, and it was very difficult to get food ordered in, obviously, during the beginning months, um, and that was very welcome. We um, relaxed our dress policy a little bit so that people could um, wear whatever scrubs they wanted, which is, um, you know, sort of the, you know, everyone's watched TV shows with scrubs on them, but they were able to wear their own so that they could launder our own scrubs um, in, in the way that they wanted and they could change them out in, with much more frequency. We also provide hazard pay for them and um, we did provide um, um, bonuses throughout. So we really did try to, try to um, you know, make sure that they were safe. In addition, on any of the floors where we did treat people with the virus, we installed shower facilities for them so that they could be sure that they wouldn't track any of the virus back on clothing or materials like that. So um, I don't know, Mike, if there were things that I missed um, in that in that lineup of things. Actually, I think that's spot on, but I would just uh, give the subcontext here around what we're trying to do not only to take care of the employee, but understanding they had there is a downstream ramification to their family. So for example, installing the showers to ensure the safety of their family understanding when everything went into lockdown in our community, a lot of our staff members may not have had the same access to the grocery stores and restaurants or the restaurants they used to get food from. So by, by providing meals for all three shifts, we knew that our staff were at least gonna have something uh, solid in their bellies and they were gonna be nurtured and taken care of. So I think in everything Kim said, you really should have seen our pastoral care team they really kicked it up a notch to not only provide uh, support and emotional support to our residents, but also to the staff. Technology, innovation, how technology and innovation has played a role in the middle of this pandemic. It's, we have been talking with business owners and really people, you know, start really using a lot of this. So what was the experience of San Anson on use of technology? Um, well, we, I think that um, we had the same experience that we had to come up with creative ways to engage, as you said, our staff and our residents. Um, so obviously, um, with the, the video platform was 
essential to keep them connected with their families. So we, uh, we created something called a buddy system. So every resident, um, because they couldn't have that face-to-face -face contact with their families, was um, sort of paired up with a staff member here at St. Anne's and they became their buddy. Um, and so the buddy would go up and really provide that human contact with them, you know, um, you know, talk with them, chat with them, obviously doing social distancing and wearing all the appropriate PPE. But their other job was to, you know, sort of be the, be the liaison with the family. So they would orchestrate Zoom meetings. Um, we, we also have window visits. So they're in charge of sort of coordinating that where um, um, the, the resident can be um, in front of the window with the phone and see their loved one outside the window. Well, thank you guys. We'll be back with more after these messages. And no one has a, a crystal ball. No one knows what we can happen. But what, are, what will be the key recommendation in terms of proactiveness? And how proactively can we be now that we have some experience in our hands on managing the COVID-19? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, uh, there is so much uncertainty that I guess your, your point is that we do have to be prepared and ready for um, the second wave. Um, we have done so much work um, these last few months that we certainly are better prepared for sure, just by virtue of all the lessons learned from the last um, weeks to months. Um, so from our perspective, I think the um, the way to to stay prepared for this is really to continue to implement a lot of those lessons in real time. Um, it is very we're very fortunate right now. We have no COVID in any of our buildings. Um, no, we have no residents who are um, affected right now. And so it's very easy, as you can imagine, after going through what you know we all went through, to kind of feel like, oh, take a sigh, let down your guard a little bit. I think that. One of the challenges is to try to get staff to remember you really can't completely ever let, let down your guard, particularly going into the cooler season. Um, but we have, um, I, I guess, um, what, what we have been doing is continuing with those open lines of communication and daily communication. Because the one thing that you know about COVID, as we all do, is that we learn something new every day. We learn something new from what other people failed to do or did well, and you need to kind of continue to um, put that message out. And all because there's so much misinformation um, about the illness, it's really important. You know, people will read something on the internet or Facebook, and, you know, they'll be having that kind of stirring around in, the, in their gut. And it's really important then to have these open dialogues, the huddling, the constant communication. What are you hearing? What are you feeling? What are you worrying about? How are you going to handle the schools? Um, I think one of our challenges going um, forward into the fall is, of course, we have a lot of working moms here and working dads, and they are struggling trying to know how they are going to make sure their family is well cared for, but still get here, get here on time. And so we're trying to support them through that. Um, so we are prepared in that we have really good um, access now to PPE. We have better access to testing. We're still working a little bit on that. I think that we have learned to be um, good at being nimble and adopting things, but then also being very um, clear that if it's just not working, be open and honest about it and tell us, okay, well, you guys thought that that was a great way to handle it, but these are the challenges with that solution. How, how about this idea? And so we have become better at communicating, I think, and cross-training and being able to tell people, hey, I thought about it this way. What do you think? And, uh, you know, we have always been a good organization with that because, of course, um, when, you're, when you're taking care of people, you have to be good at communicating. Um, but I think we really have been able to grow um, in that way. So I think our, our best um, weapon against COVID going forward is um, the lessons we've learned, the um, open communication, the the team that has that has endured this is a team that is stronger, more nimble, um, more creative, um, much more cohesive. Believe it or not, um, and I think that that is what's going to get us through whatever is coming in the fall. We are also very fortunate to be 
supported by great colleagues in acute care and in academic medicine. And we also have been invited to be part of vaccine trials. So we're, we're embracing things like that as well. Um, I think that if you work in healthcare and you have a higher rate of potentially being exposed, um, such as our nurses, or it is important for you to have access to at least consider vaccination um, perhaps earlier than people that have a lower risk. So we're partnering with um, Dr. Edward Walsh and Ann Falsey, um, who work at both the University and Rochester Regional to be part of their vaccine trials and to offer that to our staff if they want it. Certainly not obligatory, but something that they could partake of. Well, I have one quick question. I've been really inspired by the tremendous change you were able to undertake and, and do successfully in such a large organization. Can you share with us um, something along the way that maybe inspired you? Something a staff person said or did, maybe something you read, uh, anything that might have inspired you to get through this? Um, I'll share really quickly for me, it was, uh, I'm a big student of history. My dad was in the army a long time. And so just thinking of, um, you know, how people, you know, toughed it out and got through some past wars in our country, whether it was World War II or other things, that was one of the things that said, well, you know, we can, we can do this. Anything like that with you guys that you saw or heard from staff or somewhere else? Um, sure. I'll. I'll uh, well, first of all, the greatest privilege of our of Mike and my um, job is that we get those inspirations a lot more, I think, than other other industries because those sage people are, you know, right around us all the time, telling us and reminding us of what is important. It is truly um, a wonderful, uh, wonderful job, and um, older people can teach us so much. Um, we we as a society just need to perhaps recognize that a little bit better. Um, but yes, I, um, we, I was with a nurse and we were on the COVID and um, we had, you know, um, residents who had the virus and we were going in to take care of them. And um, the resident was pretty sick. You know, she um, needed a lot of care and um, she's doing fine now. So that's, that's the good part of the story, but she was pretty sick at one point and we went in to give her care and she looked right at us and she smiled and she said, oh, you know what, I'm really okay. I'm very worried that you two little ladies are gonna get this and you must have little kids at home and I don't want you, I don't want you to get sick. So I'll, I'll, you don't need to do any of this for me. I'll take care of it myself. And it just reminded me of the spirit of older people, which is they're always, in my experience, looking out for their fellow human. Um, it, whether it's generational or whether it comes with wisdom, but they always are looking out for the greater good. And it kind of stopped us both in our tracks because here she was sick, um, probably feeling pretty terrible. And she like stopped and wanted us to be safe. And, you know, so much of what happened during the beginning parts of COVID were people worrying about themselves and worrying about, well, I don't want to get it and all this. And here was this woman who just, really was like, girls, I got this. Um, so I, I am always inspired by them, but that was certainly a time where I almost had tears in my eyes and I thought, geez, like if she can act like that in the midst of this being so ill, then we have to keep going on and taking care of these people throughout whatever it takes, we have to get it done, so. You know, if I may just jump in for a moment and maybe add to Dr. Patron, it actually, there are different points of inspiration throughout the process, but I'll share with what you what happened just a few weeks ago. As society starting to open back up, I needed to meet with a board member and we met at a local restaurant. And the meeting was for eight o'clock. There are a few minutes early to get in and get settled. And as I walk in, here are two aides from St. Anne's that had just finished their midnight shift at 7 a.m. And they were going out together to have breakfast. So I sat in the booth across from them uh, at a diagonal and we started to talk. They were talking about different things and I have a long reach. And with that, I may have accidentally slipped and grabbed their check to take care of the bill for them. And they said, oh, you don't have to do that. Thank you. And I said, no, I want to thank you for what you do each and every day. And they both stopped me dead in my tracks and see do it for our residents. And when I heard him say our residents, that sense of ownership, the care and compassion, if we didn't show up and do our job, who would be there to care for them? We have to do it every day. 
and they joked about who called in the last time and they were proud of the fact that neither one of them had missed a day since COVID had started in five months. That's pretty, pretty inspirational when you talk about somebody on the front lines in full PPE doing all sorts of very difficult work and they were bragging about the care they're providing. That's just, that's cool stuff. Well, Mike, Dr. Petron, really through your story and your experience passing through one of the most challenging times in history, probably, and definitely in terms of our generation, definitely the biggest challenge uh, globally. But one thing is fundamental. Uh, I think the organization has been faithful to their core values and their principles and great organizations overcome the challenges based on those foundations and those principles. So thank you for telling us your experience in Be Inspired. We appreciate and I'm sure that we will have you in the future in other program. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next week, we'll meet Limbrada Paz and learn about her experience both a migrant worker, working with migrant communities, and now owning her own business. To watch today's episode and the complete interviews of our guests, go to rochesterfirst.com slash be inspired. For more great talk with Rochester's entrepreneurs, listen to Bodet 97.1, Saturdays at 9 a.m. For Mauricio Riveros, I'm Julio Sainz. We'll see you next week on Be Inspired.